Change resistance. It's the bane of change leaders' existence. But should it be? Could change resistance actually be a blessing? And if you are the target of an organizational change initiative, should you keep your doubts and concerns to yourself? Well, employees at any level of the organization can resist a change initiative, uh, from the C-suite to frontline workers and every employee in between. Regardless of job title, being a manager in one part of the business does not necessarily mean that you will be charged with being a change manager, too. Despite the job title, a department manager might be a change target while a team leader may also be a change leader. Now, understanding the fundamental differences between change leaders and change targets is crucial when an organization is attempting massive change. In talking with change leaders over the years, one of the biggest challenges that I've seen is the anger related to perceived change resistance from the change targets. Change leaders often categorize employees as resistant if they even question the veracity of the need for change, or the method of changing, or even the potential outcomes of that change. In fact, many change management consultants recommend that change leaders get the right people on the bus. And this means accepting ideas only from those employees who appear to wholeheartedly embrace the change and dismissing anybody else as a change resistor who they need to get off the bus. I disagree with this advice. Indeed, I am shocked that a change leader would discount the insights and concerns of employees when asking them to fundamentally shift their work processes, assumptions, and routines. As the original photo above says, I don't think so. I've created something called the Change Resistance Zoo. Now, change resistance is defined as efforts focusing on impeding, redirecting, rejecting, or stopping the change. This was according to Curtsy in 1999. Now, it is often thought as being overt, but it can also be very effectively done through covert actions. Although change resistance is viewed as a bad thing that needs to be eliminated from the workplace, employee resistance to proposed organizational change can also be a very good thing. According to Lawrence way back in 1954, when resistance does appear, it should not be thought of as something to overcome. Instead, it can best be thought of as a useful red flag, a signal that something is going wrong. In general, a certain amount of resistance should and must be anticipated when an organization demands that its workers change their working behaviors, processes, or even attitudes. These responses are diverse and will vary based on the employee's perception of the changes being asked of him or her. Therefore, there is no one change-resistant response or behavior. What employees will exhibit as resistance will vary greatly, and for both change leaders and change targets, it's important to understand these differences. Based on my research, I've developed six attitudes toward change in what I call the change-resistant zoo. Each type 
views change somewhat differently, which consequently leads to distinctly different behaviors and responses throughout a change initiative. The first one is the ostrich. The employee who avoids change at all costs is like the ostrich sticking its head in the sand. Ostriches staunchly deny what is going on in the organization and may even view the current status quo as being not that bad, really. So rather than change, ostriches will often resign from an organization, either when changes are anticipated or after the change initiative is lost. So here's what's bad about ostriches. These are the die-hard change resistors who dislike any degree of change to the status quo. They are in denial and will do anything to avoid making the change. And this is particularly bad for the organization if one of your key employees is an ostrich. But here's what's good about ostriches. Even though they dislike changes to their status quo, ostriches are also smart enough to realize that the changes are going to happen, so it's better for them and the company if they find a more suitable work environment with another employer. The next change resistor is the mole. The mole is sneaky about refusing to go along with the changes. Rather than being upfront about their doubts, the mole goes underground and covertly sabotages the changes. This could be through missed deadlines or by spreading negative gossip about how the change is progressing or what it really means for employees. So here's what's bad about moles. Moles can sow seeds of discord and fear among not only their immediate co-workers, but throughout the organization. And because their resistant tactics are covert, moles can be difficult to spot. And there's always a logical excuse for a missed deadline, and it's rare to catch them as the source of misinformed or outright malicious gossip. But here's what's good about moles. Consider the option that the mole has a good reason for refusing to change. Now, even though they can be toxic in the workplace, moles serve as an indication that something has not been considered when planning and implementing the change initiative. Next is the tiger. <laughs> but unlike the covert activities of the mole, the tiger is vocal and aggressive in resisting the changes. Tigers will argue with change leaders by challenging their ideas and assumptions about the changes. Their goal is to attack everything related to the change initiative so that it will not proceed. And what's bad about tigers? Well, they are disruptive and combative, which can make other employees uncomfortable regardless of whether those employees support or disagree with the changes. And unlike moles, it's easy to spot a tiger, but it's also harder to deal with them in a rational and calm way. So here's what's good about tigers. The tigers will let you know what is a contentious aspect of the change initiative. There is no guesswork involved. So try to discuss the tiger's concerns in private so that they don't damage employee morale and remain calm. There is a good chance that the area of disagreement might be eligible for some sort of compromise that creates a win-win outcome 
in the proposed changes. Next is the dog. Now the dog will never directly challenge the activities or expectations in the change initiative, but that is unless they're a part of a group of more vocal employees. Believing that there is power in the pack, dogs resist the change initiative through a group effort and they're not afraid to fight dirty. Now here's what's bad about dogs. Dogs may be man's best friend, but they can also be terrifying in an angry pack, particularly a pack that is united in staunchly fighting the change initiative in whole or in part. And because change is frightening, some employees may go along with the pack because they fear being ostracized by their peers or coworkers. But here's what's good about dogs. Because dogs are part of a pack, swaying the opinion of one dog toward the change initiative can lead to the entire group becoming more receptive to the changes. And also, if there's a group of employees who have banded together to fight some aspect of the change initiative, this is a clear indication that the change initiative most likely has unintentional, deleterious effects for a subset of the workforce. Next is the owl. The owl is usually an experienced employee, someone who has been with the company for a long time or is recognized as an expert in their field. Because they are wise and knowledgeable, they will point out minute flaws in any aspect of the change initiative. The challenge is that owls believe that although it is their duty to identify problems, they consider that any active involvement in remedying those problems is beneath them. So here's what's bad about owls. Owls can appear to be condescending. Know-it-alls who focus too much on the details but miss the big picture. By overlooking the broader outcomes associated with the change initiatives, owls can develop tunnel vision that obscures any information that is not within their area of expertise or interest. And this can be particularly damaging if an owl is selected to lead a change initiative. But here's what's good about owls. Subject matter expertise and knowledge are essential criteria for an employee to be considered an owl. And as a result, they have a breadth and depth of knowledge about how the changes will affect their department or unit or location. So listen to them, but also encourage them to take the lead in improving the steps in the change initiative so that they can then mentor others to create the necessary changes. And finally, we have the last, the snail. The snail just kind of creeps along with their tasks. <laughs> their goal is to avoid making any waves. And this reaction to change is usually based on fear about the potential consequences. So they will make every effort to avoid detection. So what's bad about snails? Well, it's difficult to understand how a snail feels about a change initiative. Because they tend to fly under the radar, they are often overlooked or tend to avoid discussing their opinions in meetings. They do their jobs in a way that makes their performance less likely to stand out from the crowd for either good or bad results. But here's what's good about snails. Snails 
will continue to get their work done, but don't expect them to wholeheartedly embrace the changes. But because the work is still getting done, this can be a good thing for consistency during a change initiative. And also, snails won't make a scene or add to the disruption in a workplace undergoing change. So identifying an employee as one of these zoo animals does not mean the change leaders should attempt to squash their responses. It's quite the opposite. Change leaders should view their reactions to the proposed changes as red flags or even beacons warning about aspects of the change initiative that may have been overlooked. Change resistors can actually prevent a change initiative from derailing. Well, if they are respected and listened to. So here are five quick tips to benefit from the insights of change resistors. Change leaders can only observe the behaviors of these animals in the change resistance zoo in response to their requests to change. But it takes a little more digging to unmask the why behind these perspectives. The following five tips will help you better understand the reasons behind change resistant employees' behaviors and then adapt your management style to help guide them toward acceptance of the desired changes. So, tip number one, communicate the practical economic reasons for the change, but don't forget to include emotional appeals to employees' values. This transforms the change initiative from a cold, quantitative rationale to one that is inspirational and motivating. Tip number two, always listen to employees' concerns before, during, and after a change initiative. Resistant behaviors and words that are not acknowledged can potentially undermine the desired changes. Tip number three, respect employees' fears about the changes by taking an evolutionary approach to change. Rather than focusing on what will change, also highlight what will remain the same. This provides a sense of security for workers. Tip number four. Include employee input throughout the change initiative. I mean, don't just spring changes on employees. Instead, frame the problem that needs to be addressed and ask key employees and network leaders for their opinions on how to remedy the problem. In nearly all cases, this will involve a change of some kind, but it will be embraced because the employees had input into how this will be achieved. And finally, tip number five, focus on the resistance as a potential treasure trove of new ideas. So tap down any feelings of anger and resentment that your workers are not immediately embracing the changes. Remember that it is M possible to predict every possible outcome or effect of a change initiative. So listen to your change resistors for insights that you might have overlooked and which could potentially sabotage the changes.